So um, there are um, differences of uh, experience implied in the naked uh, or nude representation of women. Athenian women lived lives very separate from their men. It was a curiously divided society. Now, Athenian women did not do public athletics and it would have been considered very shocking if they'd shown themselves naked in public. This is Nereid. She's a sea nymph um, and she's got wet, not unreasonably. Nymphs get a terrible press, I think, because their name implies that they are all up for sex all the time, hence nymphomaniac. But actually, the opposite is true. Nymphs are always trying to avoid having sex with uh, male figures who are pursuing them. They're always on the run. She's wearing clothes, but as you can see, they make no difference whatsoever to how naked it makes her look. The clothing is so thin, you can see her navel through it, you can see the line at the bottom of her belly, uh, the lines of the drapery, if anything, draw our eyes down her body to make us gaze at her more longingly. Um, the drapery does nothing to hide her modesty. If anything, it makes her more erotically charged. It's a direct contrast to the way the male statues are shown. Anyway, where were we? And then Socrates says, no, hold on a minute. Is there anything that isn't a beautiful girl which is beautiful, would you say, hippie ass? Anything at all, like a horse? Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> a what? <laughs> that's your first counter-example of something that's beautiful that isn't a beautiful girl, is a horse? <laughs> Has it all gone a bit equus here? Well, not equus, because that would be Latin. Uh, hippos. Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter now. Um, so, yes, he it, it says, yes, a horse, a horse is beautiful. Yep, fair play, a beautiful horse can be beautiful. And Socrates says, well, what about man-made things? A lovely musical instrument, like a lyre or a pot, a beautiful pot. Uh, those beautiful? And Hippias says, yeah, those are beautiful. Socrates suggests to Hippias that beauty can be in all kinds of objects, including a two-handled pot. Looking at this, you can't help but think he was right. This pot is even older than Socrates. It dates back from about 480 BC, so it would have been 10 years old when Socrates was born, and it's still absolutely exquisite. This particular pot shows a relatively rare study of the African body in Greek art. It depicts Memnon, the mythical hero and Ethiopian king, flanked by his warriors as they fought to defend Troy against the Greeks. I think the idea was to show that he had transcended to becoming godlike, that he really had risen the ranks and kind of fought in battle, and here he was now, he stands before you, um, as something of an inspiration. He is both black but also part of the Greek identity because there was, at that time, less of a focus on your race being what defined you and more about strength and ability. So I love the idea of kind of looking back and seeing a kind of heritage of incredibly strong, able black heroes. This man's looking at him, it looks to me with a little envy in his yeah. heart. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It looks like it's where he would like to be. That's um, exactly what I think, <laughs> yeah. You said he's somebody to be emulated. Yeah. I think it's a, a point that often gets kind of overlooked, is that this vase was made in Greece, in Athens, and the Greeks were on the other side of <laughs> the Trojan War. But they still Memnon... love him that much to Absolutely. celebrate him, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Memnon fought with the Trojans, and that's who they've chosen to celebrate on this pot, not their own guys, yeah. the other guys. How rare is that? Yeah, I thought it was great, because it really does show how respected, you know, Memnon was. This isn't just some warrior. This is w one who came in and impressed the enemy so much that the enemy crafted a, a vase in his honour. Yeah, know, he's a amazing. hero to his enemies. Yeah. So Hippias, he offers one last definition before Socrates takes over. He says, OK, a beautiful, a beautiful life, a fine, beautiful life. The word is the same in Greek, kalos. Um, he says, OK, one of those, uh, that's if you uh, live for a long time and you're healthy and you're rich and you bury your parents, brackets, after they are dead, um, <laughs> and you, in turn, will be buried by your children and you're respected by everyone. He 
even in this exhibition, which is filled with so many beautiful living bodies, there's a little bit of death, including this fellow here. This is a Roman grave marker from the second century AD, and it's written in Greek. Beneath the inscription, there is a decomposing body. You can see his skull, his ribs, the bones in his arms and legs. Um, in other words, we're not seeing a celebration of who this person was when they were alive. We're seeing who they're rotting away to be now that they are dead. And the inscription backs that up. It asks the question of a passerby, can you tell who's buried here? Is it Hylas, a very beautiful youth, a friend of Heracles, or is it Thersites, a very plain, ugly man from the Iliad? In other words, was this person beautiful or were they ugly? Doesn't matter, in death we're all the same. And Socrates says, OK, I'll offer some definitions, so I'll do that. Number one, things that are beautiful need to be appropriate. That sounds reasonable. He says, OK, uh, let's... So maybe what's beautiful is, um, is a type of pleasure, auditory or visual... Auditory and visual pleasure. So a beautiful song is, is beautiful, is fine. Um, a beautiful painting is fine. And they go, yep, yeah, this is great. And then Socrates goes... I suppose my friend might have a couple of exceptions. And if he's like, oh, come on. <laughs> Could he overlook them? Could we go? So he tries one last time, one final roll of the dice. Uh, Socrates clinching argument, he says, and sex, which feels delightful. It's a very pleasant experience. But it is, and I quote, a contemptible sight. <laughs> <laughs> so in every regard, these men are admirable and desirable, and which... Uh, not so six-packed person wouldn't want to look like them. There's just maybe one aspect to these statues that I think people might not find quite so ambitious. Is What's that fair? That, it's the fact that they all have really small genitals. Do they? They do. I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, they could be average. Don't, uh, don't judge me. Well, once that's been said, nobody's going to deny it, are they? <laughs> but um, I think... Um, they are um, sexually reduced, let's say. The sexual let's, charge let's of the that. object is reduced so that, as to emphasise the fact that these are not sexual objects. They are representations of the nude ideal figure in art. So, in the Hippias, Socrates suggests that what's beautiful should also be appropriate. And this figure doesn't look as obviously appropriate um, to an exhibition on the Greek body uh, as some of the other pieces. As you can see, he's a man, quite clearly. He's extremely primitive, comparatively speaking. He's from the 8th century BC. Uh, there's no musculature or beauty obvious to it at first glance. Instead, he's quite a simplistic figure. Um, you can see he has quite spindly arms and legs. As for the mystery of why he has an erect penis, I think it's meant to convey the enormous trauma that this character is undergoing. He's probably Ajax, the Greek hero, who loses a fight with Odysseus for Achilles' armour during the Trojan War, he's so traumatised by the loss of face, uh, because reputation is everything to Greek heroes, um, that he goes on a killing spree overnight. He kills livestock, thinking that they are Trojan enemies. He's so humiliated when he realises it the next morning that he takes his own life, and he does that by driving a sword into his belly. This is the exact moment which this sculpture has caught, which makes it especially extraordinary that it's telling a whole story with this tiny, tiny figure. It's a strange piece of sculpture. I thought when I first saw it that I probably didn't like it because it's so much less beautiful than so many other pieces here. But the more time I spend looking at it, the more I've kind of taken to him. There is something infinitely tragic about him. And uh, the way his whole body seems to be tensed and strained as the knife is coming towards him, it's incredibly poignant.
the ancient Greeks invented the human body as we now understand it. They invented the human condition. They invented the human being. They, they took the representation of the human body to an extent of, of, of importance in, in our sense of ourselves that no, nobody has been able ever since to forget it or to deny it. I think within our Western subconscious and within our Western culture, we've inherited a Greek idea of, of, of the beautiful figure. We're married to this legacy of antiquity, for better and for worse, and I think we have to recognise that in all sorts of different ways. The Greek sculpture of the body shapes and changes the way Europeans think about their body today. For Europe, what happens in Greece and subsequently is the determinant model. And that's the point of the exhibition. It changes the way you can look at something you thought you knew. So in the end, they agree that they know nothing. They are exactly where they started out, knowing nothing at all. The final words of this dialogue, Socrates quotes an old Greek aphorism. He says, um, it's true that kalapa ta kala, everything beautiful is difficult. But it's worth bearing in mind that uh, beautiful objects for the Greeks have a, a resonance that perhaps, well, let's say hopefully, they don't always have for us. Um, perhaps my favourite story uh, about any statue in the ancient world is about the statue of Aphrodite at Knidos, long since gone, I'm afraid, which was legendarily beautiful and extremely saucy, to put it mildly. <laughs> so saucy, in fact, that legend has it that a young man fell in love with the statue when he went to visit it, and he got himself locked in the temple overnight, and then had what I think we can euphemistically describe as a delightful evening. <laughs> and then the next day, proof of his delightful evening <laughs> was visible on the thigh of the statue. I'm trying so hard not to use the word stain, and it's going so badly <laughs> that I think we're just going to have to accept it. Um, and he was so ashamed of his behaviour that he ran and threw himself off a cliff and died. So the problem with beauty is that it is difficult and occasionally too alluring and uh, cliffs too near. Um, so that's everything. <laughs>When Socrates tried to define beauty, the best he could come up with was that it was difficult to define. That's exactly how I feel two and a half thousand years later. Like Socrates, I guess, at least I know that I know nothing. But Socrates also said that the unexamined life was not worth living. Asking questions is important, coming up with answers less so. If you do want to ask questions about what beauty really is, there are a lot worse places to start than with the legacy the ancient Greeks left to us. Stay with us here on BBC Four. We're exploring the hopes and dreams of the millions of people making daily use of the Bombay Railway. Next.